Thank you, Dr. Keshanlal. I would like to first express my appreciation to Dr. Keshanlal and to INSA for starting such an activity, uh, lectures which go just beyond the specialization of an individual and with facilities for people also to listen to the lectures if they cannot come here for some reason. This is a very, very nice experiment and I congratulate INSHA in starting this and I can only tell you that I consider it a great honor and privilege to be part of this series and to have the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon for of some things that I and my students are very passionately interested in. We are always very pleased to talk to people about what we do because we work on insects and insects do not occupy the thinking space of most people most of the time and I would like to increase the thinking uh, space if of people about insects. What we, we are so concerned and lost in human problems that we do not realize that there may be help elsewhere. There are many species of animals especially insects which organize themselves into societies and at the very least one can expect that they will face very similar problems to the ones that we face because we organize ourselves also into societies. And therefore, understanding how these insects deal with the problems that their societies present themselves would be very enlightening uh, for us. In many ways they are similar to us because when individuals live in a group there is of course scope for conflict and there is also scope for cooperation. In addition there is necessity for communication, there is necessity for division of labor, there is necessity for decision making, for leadership all of this automatically happen when living beings get together and this does not ha just happen to humans it also happens to insects. I and my students have been trying to understand how one particular we take one particular species as an example and try and see how they actually balance between conflict and cooperation. Now I will have the opportunity today to show you actually some of these experiments that we do and how we do these experiments and how we interpret these experiments. I am always very eager to convey to the non-specialist how we interpret our experiments and it is only when non-specialist says yes I think your interpretation is reasonable then we get confidence because we are so into it we keep on interpreting the way we want. It is always good to get feedback from people outside the field. Before I actually go to the experiments let me spend a few minutes giving you a slightly more detailed introduction to insect societies. What you see here on this slide is a social wasp. And I will come to sort of social wasps in the end of this introduction. Let me begin with something that is more familiar to people which is the honey bee. Honey bees live in fairly populous colonies. A colony of honey bee may, may consist of anywhere from 20 to 60 thousand individuals. They build a nest made from wax. They make this wax themselves. So, the worker bees will go to flowers and drink nectar and take the uh, carbohydrate in the nectar using the metabolism of their body convert it into wax and secrete this wax out of their body through a small gland in their abdomen. Using that wax they will construct a large sheet of wax and on either side of this wax they will construct perfectly hexagonal cells and they use these cells both to rear young honey bees as well as to store their food. A large number of bees therefore are uh, uh, required for this job and they all sit on such a nest. Now, if you look at these bees carefully, every honey bee colony has three kinds of bees. There are, there is usually one single large fertile female which you see in the center of this slide here, who is the only one who actually reproduces and we call her the queen bee. On the left side you see here is a slightly fatter individual, this is a male bee and usually called a drone, not to be confused with the drone that is. Uh, famous uh, in the army these days, but these are called drones and the honey bee queen she actually does only two things. One is she lays eggs and she can lay thousands of eggs per day because if you have a population of 60,000 and many of them are dying and you want to maintain that population you should be able to lay thousands of eggs per day and she is capable of doing that. The only other thing she does other than laying eggs is she produces and releases outside her body a large number of chemical substances 
some very volatile some not so volatile and these chemicals chemical substances help to coordinate the activities of the whole colony not necessarily in a top down dictatorial fashion, but in a self organized fashion. These are the only two things she does. Now, what do the drones do? The drones are proverbially lazy. In fact, the drones do not do anything. They do not participate in domestic work. They are born on in the colonies. They stay in the colonies for some time till they mature and then they go out in search of virgin queens from other colonies. And they actually mate high up in the air with virgin queens if they find them and if they are successfully mate with them, they actually die in the process of mating. A portion of their genitalia are left hanging on the queen bee and they die within a few minutes. If they are not successful, they come back and they go again, but they do not perform any domestic work. Which means all the work is left to the third class of bees which are small, tiny, nearly sterile female bees which we call the worker bees and everything that is required to run such a society is done by the workers. They and the workers do this in a very systematic fashion. How does a bee get up in the morning and know what I should be doing today? It finds out how old it is. What it does is a function of its age. The youngest bee will be a cleaner bee. A few days later her wax glands will develop and she will become a builder. Before that she could not build because her wax glands were not ready. A few days later other glands in her mandible will develop and now she will be able to produce various chemicals which are required to feed the young bees. So, a mixture of pollen and nectar and secretions are used to feed the bees and there may be 10, 20 thousand hungry mouths to be fed and that is the job there that is roughly the third job they do in their life. A few days later they start moving about and they start cleaning the they start guarding the nest they start removing dead bees and start processing food then they will go out and wait at the entrance receive food brought by other bees and process it and store it finally in the second half of their lives they will go out of the colony looking for food and bring back food to this so in this systematic fashion the worker bees each bee will complete all the tasks that it is required to task and then most of the bees actually die in the process of foraging. So, through such a age dependent division of labor almost all the work is done by the worker bees. Here is a picture of a queen bee you see she is larger than the rest the individual here in the center she is the queen bee and what you see in this photograph is that the queen bee is surrounded actually by a small group of worker bees. You might say that these worker bees are on special royal duty. Their job is to clean the queen, lick the queen and feed her. She has no time to do any of these things. As she moves from, uh, across the nest finding places to lay eggs, they are moving with her all the time cleaning her and licking her and feeding her. The interesting thing is that if you mark these bees and we can do that easily with little spots of colored paint, we also do this for our wasp and you watch this for a while you will find something very unusual. You will find that a few minutes later the bees which are so seriously now attending to the queen seem to lose interest in this job and go off and do something else and somebody else who is doing something else will come and take up this job. And you will find if you watch this over a long period of time that this royal duty is done in shifts of a few minutes at a time and there is a very interesting consequence of this working in shift. Namely, it provides opportunities for a large fraction of the workers to come in physical proximity to the queen and get the chemicals that she is producing and that is how they are up to date on what is happening in the colony. That is how the workers would know if the queen is sick, if she is dying, she is not able to lay eggs anymore, the workers would usually know that. What you see on this picture is a worker bee at a flower and you see here on the legs of the bee at the bottom here on the legs of the bees you what you see are two pollen baskets. So, bees collect basically two items from nature nectar from flowers and pollen from flowers. They store nectar temporarily in their crop and they pack pollen on the hind legs in what are called pollen baskets come home deliver this go back bring some more and they can do this continuously for a long period of time if they have found a large source of food. What you see here is perhaps one of the most sophisticated things that honeybees can do. Honeybees 
have a kind of symbolic language which can be compared in some ways to human language. When a bee goes out and finds food and finds a large amount of food that by itself it cannot bring back, it is capable of coming home and recruiting naive bees to bring back this food. And it is able to do that by communicating to the bees at home what it has found, how much it has found, how far away and how to get there. All of this information is conveyed through a dance language. In fact, the Austrian zoologist Carl von Frisch discovered the dance language for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1973 and he showed that bees are able to make this kind of communication. Bees of course are not the only social insects, ants are famous examples of highly social insects. There are only some 10 or 15 species of bees, honey bees, but there are at least 12,000 species of ants, all of which are social. And ants also live in very populous colonies, in fact even more populous colonies than honey bees, you may have hundreds of thousands, you may have millions of individuals in one colony and they all have to work together and you can see that occasionally you would have a problem of getting in each other's way. Here for example is a photograph where the bees are trying to, there are two leaves there, they are trying to bring these two leaves together. This ant is appropriately called the weaver ant. It makes nests by stitching leaves together. So the way it does, you can see hundreds of ants are required, several of them will latch on to one leaf, others to the other leaf and by their combined strength they will align the edges of these leaves together and then they will stitch these edges. Now, how do they stitch them? They stitch them with silk fibers no less. Where do they get the silk fibers? No adult insect is known to be capable of producing silk. Producing silk is the prerogative of the larvae because they make it for their own requirement when they have to make a cocoon for themselves when they pupate. So, when these leaves are aligned, one of the workers will go inside, catch hold of a full grown larva bring her outside and squeeze her appropriately and she will then donate, now I will use an anthropomorphic language and they will persuade her to donate some silk for the community good and using that silk they will stitch these things together. We only have to sit back and imagine how much cooperation and coordination and scope for conflict is available in such a sequence of events. If I were a larva I might have said why me, why do not you pick up that larva? Do the larvae say this? We can find out through experiments. The second amongst the ants, for the bees I said perhaps the most sophisticated things they have done is the language. For the ants perhaps the most sophisticated thing they have done is they have invented a form of agriculture which is remarkably similar to human agriculture. They do not grow flowering plants as we do, but they cultivate fungi. There are several species of ants which actually grow fungus gardens and the way it works is that some ants like this one will go out find an appropriate species of tree and cut the leaves into small pieces sufficient of the right size to be carried back home. So, if you walk in a forest in central or south America you will find a whole line of ants like this marching back with a leaf in their head as if it is like a flag. Hundreds and thousands of pieces of leaves are brought home. At home there are ants who are smaller in their body size and therefore they are capable of shredding these leaves into fine powder and this powder is spread on the ground and fungal mycelia from the neighboring part of the garden is then actually planted where this food is and it is the spores of this fungus that they consume. They do not consume the leaves. An ant colony uh, one, at least in some species may have 1 million individuals and the food of all the 1 individuals comes from the agricultural produce. And they have of course have problems of fertilization, they have problems of pests, all of these problems they have and people are now beginning to study how the ants deal with this because they also produce a monoculture. So, they have the same kinds of problems that we have, how do they deal with that and they have been doing that uninterrupted for 50 million years. Our agriculture is about 10 to 15 thousand years old. Then I come back, come finally to my most favorite group of social insects, the so called social wasps. In fact, most wasps are not social, the few that are social are called paper wasps and the reason why they are called paper wasps is that they do not make the nest, their nest from wax as bees do or from leaves as ants do or from soil as termites do, but they make paper nests. This is a nest and you can see the whole envelope is covered 
through with a paper envelope. And if you open this, you will find that there are several tiers. I like to say that if you open this, what you will see is a multi-storied apartment complex because these are multiple floors. All of this is made from paper. In each of these, there are hexagonal cells in which they will rear their young ones. Unfortunately, they cannot store food like the bees because they are entirely non-vegetarian. They only eat other insects and spiders and unfortunately, they have not invented refrigeration. So, they are not able to store food. They have to find their food every day. But where to get the paper from? They manufacture paper by a process which is remarkably similar to the way we would manufacture paper. They will go to plants, scrape cellular fibers, chew it up in their mandibles, add various chemicals, make it into a fine pulp and spread it into a thin layer and dry it and it is paper. That is how we make paper and you can actually write on this paper. So, it is really paper and all social wasps are paper wasps. That is how they make their nests. This is the species that I and my students study. I sort of fell in love with this species when I was a first year undergraduate student because there are many of these wasps nesting in every window in my uh, department in the zoology department of central college at that time. At that time I did not know what they were, but they seemed fascinating and this was long time ago and I have not lost sight of them since then. I have been working on this initially I, I was doing my PhD in, in molecular biology, but I was working on them as a hobby and after I finished my PhD, I decided that one can convert a one's hobby into one's profession and so we work with this species, we have been working for a very long time. Now, this is a social insect, it has many features similar to ants, bees and wasps, but there are some things which are very nice about this. First you see there is no envelope, nothing is covered. So, you can actually watch everything that is happening. Secondly, you do not see a queen here. There is a queen, but she does not look different. She is one of the ordinary individuals who has temporarily been elected to be a queen. Tomorrow, she may not be the queen and any worker can aspire to become a queen and therefore, the society presents even more interesting opportunities for understanding the balance between conflict and cooperation. Those of us who study such insect societies can ask many questions, but these questions can be classified into roughly two categories, the so called how questions and the why questions. The why question basically is why are they social? The vast majority of insect species are not social. The mosquito is not a social, individual. most beetles are not social, most plant bugs are not social. Each individual does its thing, lays eggs, reproduces and dies. Why are some of these individuals social? especially because when they become social, there is only one queen or a small number of queens and the rest of the colony works for the welfare of somebody else and dies without ever reproducing, which is a Darwinian paradox. And so, there is a fundamental question, why do they do this in the first place? There are also of course, how questions, how do they manage to do this? How do they communicate? How do they divide labor? How do they know what to do? How do they know how to find their nest when they have gone out in search of food? How do they know that somebody who is trying to enter belongs to my nest or is a robber trying to come and steal something? How do they know these things? So, there are why questions and how questions which we try to answer. How do we study them? People often ask me, how do you study these things? First question they ask me is, they sting do not they? I say yes, but it is not serious. If you learn how to deal with them, you will seldom get stung and even if you occasionally get stung, it is not fatal. It is So, it, that is not really a problem. In fact, we often get stung when we are not aware that there is a wasp nearby. If you know that it is there, you know how to deal with them. So, we study them wherever they are found firstly, but we are also bring them to, able to bring them to the laboratory. Most important thing is, you can see here, we put little spots of colored paint on each wasp and each wasp then gets a name and gets an identity and this identity goes into our computer and then we get lifetime information on this. It is logged into our computer in the name of that individual. That is the first step. Second step is as I said, we study them where they occur or we are able to bring them to the laboratory and put them in cages like this here or in little plastic boxes if you want to keep a single individual. And we can stack lots of these in our laboratory. Our laboratory is called a vespiary, a place where wasps live. And all I have done is on the terrace of our building, I have built a room with wire mesh walls rather than wood and uh, concrete and brick walls, so that the wasps are free to go in and out. So, we bring the wasps from nature, we move them here, but we leave them free to go out. So, they go out, they bring their own food, 
and they are free to leave and join another colony or bring somebody else uh, guest into their colony all of that is possible. So, in such a laboratory. Thank you. But how do I forward this one? Oh, it's good. I have to use this one. All right, all right. Thank you. No problem. This, of course, is an even more important question. People say, why do you study them? What motivates you to study these? And my answer is that, so why do you study social wars? People often ask me. For the same reasons that an anthropologist studies humans, I answer. Why does an anthropology study humans? Because we are curious about how other societies live and we would be interested in comparing ourselves with them. That is why we study uh, other societies. We are not necessarily going off to Andaman Islands to learn how to live, but we are very curious about how others live and through that we want to reflect on how we live. Anthropologists can offer us a glimpse into the lives and mores of primitive and exotic human societies. Biologists can do much more. They can offer us insight from a whole range of animal societies with millions of years of evolutionary history, much more than humans can offer you. And those of us who study insect societies can hope to harness wisdom from an altogether different sub kingdom of life as far as, re as you can really go. Then the question is as human beings, can we really hope to understand insect societies? Some people even wonder whether we can understand a tribal human society. Uh, do we have the ability, because we live in our own modern cosmopolitan ur urban society. If you go and see how a tribal society is working, can you really hope to understand? With insects, the question of course is much deeper. Can we really hope to understand? And this is a question that we do not take lightly. We are very interested in this, uh, because philosophers for a long time have been interested in this question of, can we understand nature at all? And there are some famous philosophers who have had great doubts about this. Heraclitus, for example, said, nature loves to hide. We sometimes say nature is an open book, but there are philosophers who think that nature loves to hide. But one philosopher I am very fond of who said that nature does not unveil its secrets except under the torture of experiments. Okay? This is Sir Francis Bacon. So, we try our best to understand these insects through observation and through experiments. So, this is the species that we study. It is called Ropelidia marginata that is a scientific name and we are especially in under, interested in understanding the fine balance between conflict and cooperation. But before I proceed, I do want to make digress for a moment and say that I believe that the process of science is at least as important as the product, perhaps even more important than the product. The product is of interest to a very specialized group of people. What you find is of interest only to a small number of people, but how you found what you found should be of interest to a much larger people. And unfortunately, in the scientific community, whether it is research papers or books or lectures, we do not pay attention to the process. We do not communicate the process. We only communicate the final product and then there is an awe about science. And I think the divide between science and society, the misunderstandings of what science that people have is partly because we put up something mysterious as if only we could find it and it is meant for the population to consume. And I think it is important to put forward the process by which you do science and then let your audience judge whether they would come to the same conclusion that you came to with your data or maybe they will come to a different conclusion. So, we have to make this transparent and I always try to do that as and I will similarly try to do that today. And our research usually proceeds in the form of questions and answers. We make an observation and suddenly a question occurs in our mind and then we find a way of trying to answer that question. And usually when we have had some answer to that question another question immediately pops up often saying if this is so how can that work. So, a second question comes up then we try to do an experiment or observation or do something to answer the second question immediately a third question comes up and our research has been progressing like this for decades 
and there is no reason why this talk should make this any more mysterious. So, I will actually give you the question a sample of questions and how we try to answer them and how an answer led to another question. The common name is a social paper wasp, common name is paper wasp I do not ah, okay. I, I do not know the common, but in uh, the common English name is paper wasp in Kannada it is called Kanaja I do not quite know what it is called in Hindi. Okay, thank you. Oh. I already told you that in this there is a queen, but she is not different from others. She looks like everybody else. So, in the first instance, I wanted to know how does the queen behave differently from others. And I did not want to bias myself by finding out who the queen is. The only way to find out who the queen is is to see who is laying the eggs, and I did not want to do that. I did an objective study, I marked all the individuals in this colony and then we measured their behavior. And how did we measure their behavior? We actually measured how each wasp divides its time between all the different behavior that it can perform. So, we constructed what we call time budgets. How does a wasp budget its time between different behaviors? And then we subjected this numerical data to what is called multivariate statistical analysis. Basically to see if there is some method in this madness, whether there is some pattern in the variation from animal to animal. And we found to our great surprise, so uh, I just wanted to say that I will talk both about war and peace, but I will begin with some stories about peace. And as par part of this stories about peace, I was saying that I tried to measure the time activity budgets and we found that different wasps spend different proportions of the time in different behaviors. But if you add all of these behaviors, every wasp spends the same time in all the behaviors put together, but the way in which they allocate the time between different behaviors is very different. And we, so when we subjected this to statistical analysis, we found to our great surprise and you might say delight that the wasps in any colony can be organized into three groups, which we called sitters, fighters and foragers, because this group mainly seems to be lazy, sit on the nest and do very little. This group are very aggressive individuals and they are all the time trying to bite and chase and, and peck other individuals. And there is a third group which seemed to us as human beings very hard working, they would go out and bring food, so we called them foragers. Now, the, it was very satisfying to see that there is some method in madness, in this madness there is some pattern, there is some predictable reproducible pattern. But you can see immediately a question arises that if this is true, where is the queen? Is she a sitter? Is she a fighter? Is she a forager? And if we, if you read any of the prior literature, you will say of course, the queen must be a fighter. Because in such societies, where queens are not physically different from others, they are known to rule by aggression. They are known to be the most aggressive dominant individuals and they are known to use their physical aggression with the rest of the wasp to ensure that nobody else becomes a queen before my turn is over and the rest of the wasps actually do the work they are supposed to do and not just sit in the corner and lazy off. This is what is known from other species. So, it was expected that the queens would be fighters. Now, we went back to our computer files and said who is the queen or where is the queen and to our great surprise we found that the queen is not a fighter. In colony after colony, our queens are apparently lazy sitters. So, that was our first discovery. Well, the first discovery was that there are three kinds of individuals, sitters, for, uh, fighters and foragers, but the more substantial or surprising discovery was that our queens are lazy sitters. And you can immediately see this is very unsatisfying. Unsati How can it be possible? Because the queen is supposed to use physical aggression to make others work. So, we have a question. If the queen is such a meek sitter, <coughs> how does she become a queen in the first place? In other species where the queen is a very aggressive individual, biting and nudging and pecking and harassing others, maybe they have no choice in accepting her as their queen. But if our queen is a meek sitter sitting somewhere, why does everybody respect her? Why do they accept her as a queen in the first place? This itself you can see is a paradox and that is our first question in the sample that I have chosen for you. Now, in order to answer this question, we realize that we need to do an experiment and we cannot just observe some more. We have already heard enough, we have made time activity budgets, we have do not have the answer to this question. So, this is where you have to do the experiment and we design the following experiment. 
<coughs> excuse me this is called a queen removal experiment so what we do is initially we observe a natural colony all the wasps are marked and we identify the queen and we make time activity budgets for all the wasps then we actually go and physically remove the queen just the queen with the forceps put her in a bottle feed her keep her happy and observe the rest of the colony without the queen and this is sometimes dramatically called an orphaned colony a colony without the queen so once again we make time activity budgets for everybody how do they behave when they don't have a queen and when first time we did this experiment we realized at the end of the day that there is this queen sitting happily in this bottle what do we do with her so we said why not return her back to the nest and see what happens when we return her back to the nest she was happily she went back and started doing her thing and so on the third day we observed the colony again with the returned queen so we have three sets of data with queen without queen and returned queen and when we now looked at this time activity budget data we found something hugely surprising i already said in other species the queen is a very aggressive individual uses aggression for all of these thing our queen is not nevertheless we have fighters so there is a low level of aggression even in our species however as soon as we remove the queen the level of aggression in this apparently peaceful society shot up it became an extremely aggressive society the levels of aggression in some colonies went up 10 times 20 times 30 times 40 times hugely aggressive as soon as you remove the queen and what is even more remarkable is all of this new aggression was shown by one wasp one individual this is day 1 this is day 2 so this is the huge amount of aggression on day 2 very little on day 1 and you return the queen that aggression goes back so the answer okay i have to give you one more thing then we said what will happen if we don't return the queen this aggressive individual will become the next queen it's a matter of days so we called her the potential queen so when you remove the queen the individual which becomes hyper aggressive is labeled as the potential queen and when she actually lays an egg and demonstrates that she has gone on to become the next queen we call her a new queen so you have a queen you have a potential queen and then you have a new queen so ropalidia marginata queens seem to begin their careers as very aggressive individuals and only later become meek and docile and that explains the paradox of why do they respect her because when she started she was indeed very aggressive but you can see the answer is not entirely satisfactory because if this is true then we have a question how does she inhibit worker reproduction because she is only we aggressive for a few days but for the rest of her life which may be several meek weeks or several months nobody lays an egg in her presence nobody becomes a queen because she is completely respected how does it happen that is where we suspected that she produces some chemicals initially she is aggressive then she starts producing a chemical and we did a different kind of experiment we call this a mesh experiment so what we did was we took a whole colony we studied it on day 1 normal colony as before and on day 2 instead of removing the queen we took a knife and we cut the colony in half and put a wire mesh screen in between and put the two halves on either side all the wasps had been taken out <coughs> then we took one wasp tossed a coin heads you go left tails you go right take the next wasp heads you go left tails you go right finally take the queen heads you go left tails you go right so we had a queen plus half the workers on one side and the remaining workers on the other side and on the third day we moved the queen from the left to the right without disturbing the workers what was the rational of this experiment our prediction was if the queen pheromone is behave like queen right colonies that is if it is volatile this smell should go through and these workers should be satisfied that there is a queen somewhere nearby but if the queen pheromone is non volatile the queen less fragment should behave like a queen less colony the workers here should think they do not have a queen and behave appropriately and appropriately means become hyper aggressive okay and when we move the queen from one side to the other side the hyper aggressive individual here should go back to work and here an individual should become hyper aggressive and that is exactly what we have found in a large number of experiments 24 when this slide was made which was quite some time ago we always find that prediction 2 is upheld so the results look like this 
first day there is no aggression, second day on one side there is aggressive individual, on the queen less side, but when you move the queen to her side this aggression goes and another individual showing no aggression on day 2 because she was with the queen now suddenly shoots up her aggression. So, you have a potential queen 1 on this side, she goes back to work and you have a potential queen 2 on the other side. So, the answer is that Ropolidae marginata queens appear to use non volatile pheromones to inhibit worker reproduction and they do not do this through physical aggression. Again not satisfying, I probably should finish the talk and then answer questions otherwise I will run out of time. I will finish the uh, talk and then we will answer questions. Please make a note because since it is being webcast, it, I, I want to try and keep to the time. Again you can see it is satisfying at one level and deeply unsatisfying at another level. If, how can this be true? Because if this is true, how does the queen regulate the non reproductive activity of the worker? Remember in the species where the queens are aggressive, they use aggression both to suppress workers from reproducing as well as to make sure they work. Now, our queen produces a chemical and we can imagine that this chemical enters the body of the other workers and has a physiological effect on them and suppresses their ovarian development. This is easy to imagine, but I cannot send a chemical and say go and work, people can disobey this chemical. So, the pheromone is not likely to be a satisfactory answer to this question. So, the question is how does the queen regulate this? So, we did another experiment, basically the experiment very simple, we see we saw who works, then we remove the queen and see what happens. And to our great surprise we found that if you remove the queen, the workers do not care. Two examples of work bringing food, day one with queen, without queen, queen returned, absolutely no difference. The workers will continue to work whether they have a queen or not. Another example of work feeding the larvae, day one with queen, without queen, queen returned, no statistical difference in the rates at which they brought food and the rate at which they fed the larvae. So, how does the queen regulate her activity? She does not regulate, that is not her job. We now know that workers themselves regulate their own foraging in a decentralized self organized manner. Now, I will not go into great details of this, very briefly I will tell you how we did this. What we did was we asked a different question. We asked what is the function of the dominance behavior shown by the fighters? Some individuals show low levels of aggression in a normal colony. What is the function of this? And we found a weak but statistically significant positive correlation between the fraction of dominance, this aggression is called dominance behavior. So, the one who shows aggression is the dominant individual, the one who receives aggression is the subordinate individual. So, these are called dominant subordinate individuals and there is a weak correlation between how much aggression you receive and how hard you work your contribution to the foraging seems to be correlated with how much aggression you receive. So, we hypothesize that this low level of aggression is the method of self organized decentralized regulation of the work for work by themselves. So, the workers use this aggression to tell each other whether more food is required or not. And we showed this actually experimentally without going into the details, I will just show you that we showed that excess food reduces dominance behavior. If our hypothesis is correct that the way work is regulated is by showing dominance behavior, then if everybody ha is well fed, nobody should show aggression, nobody should show dominance behavior and we actually created a situation of excess food. And the way this was done was very interesting, one of my students learned that in a forceps she will take a piece of caterpillar and sit quietly in front of the wasps. Initially they will get scared, go away, after a while they will come snatch it and go away then she will give one more and then they go away take it and they give one more, they are all well fed. Now, they take it and start feeding to the young ones and the whole colony is well fed. And then we asked do they show aggression and the answer is they do not anymore. Aggression levels come down, bringing food comes down, feeding larvae comes down, dominance behavior comes down. Indeed, the dominance behavior especially that directed to foragers, the ones who are supposed to bring food aggression towards them actually comes down if everybody is well fed. Of course, we also did the converse experiment where we starved the individuals and said now they must show a lot of aggression. That was of course, bit easier than feeding them, we just had to close the door of the cage and deny them any food. When we did that, we actually showed that starvation increases dominance behavior. 
and not just randomly, but in particular, the wasps, the foragers, were the ones that were targeted. In other words, if there is no food today, if everybody is hungry today, the wasp will target those individuals who brought food yesterday. Those will be targeted specifically with aggression, and therefore we say that worker dominance behavior is used for the decentralized self-regulation of foraging by the workers themselves. Now, this is not the high level of aggression shown by the potential queen, but the low level of aggression that you find in a normal column. That leads to another question, how and when is the queen's hair decided? So, as soon as we remove the queen, one individual becomes hyper aggressive and will become the next queen if you do not replace the old queen. And everybody is obviously, as humans, we are very curious, who is this individual? How is it decided? How do the wasps decide which one is going to take the next place? Why this is fascinating is because there is only one individual. If there was a scramble competition and they all fought and the winner became queen, that is what happens in most species. But we are blessed with a very unusual species in which that is not what happens. Only one individual becomes it. How is it decided? For a long time, it was a matter of embarrassment that we had no answer. Everybody would ask us and say, no, no way we are not able to predict the identity of the successor before we actually remove the original queen. After a while, this embarrassment became too much and I said, we must do something systematic about this. We were only casually trying to answer this question without success. And the way to do this systematically, of course, is to tell a student, new student that your PhD depends on your being able to predict the next queen of the colony. So, I had a student who took up the challenge, worked very hard for 5 years, did a lot of interesting work. At the end of 5 years, she said, sorry sir, I have a lot of data, but I cannot predict who the queen is. And she actually showed a lot of data. Uh, and she showed that we could not predict the identity of the queen. I won't go into the details, but the potential queens and workers are all mixed up. She got her PhD all right, but we cannot predict who the queen is. The next student who came to the lab said, we cannot tell who the queen is, but I bet they know because they do not quarrel. Only one individual stands up as soon as you remove the queen, they must know who the next queen is. So, she said, I am going to find out if the wasps know who the next queen is. Now, for a while, many people said, you cannot answer this question. It is not a scientific question. How can you know the mind of a wasp? And we worked very hard. We tried all kinds of designs. And finally, I believe that we came up with an experimental design by which we can actually answer this question. So, what we want to do is, so the first student found that the potential queen is not unique by any criterion. And the second student said, is it possible that there is a hair designate, even though we cannot identify her? Do the other wasps know who this hair designate? That is the question. And I will show you through a quick animation what the experiment involved. The experiment involved the same old mesh experiment which I have talked to you about earlier. So, we had a nest, a box, we had a nest, we cut it in half, queen and half the workers on one side and the remaining workers on the other side. Now, imagine, let us postulate that there is a hair designate. Everybody knows except us, all the wasps know, we do not know. What would be the consequences of such a situation? We, we postulate this situation. Now, by chance alone, in half the experiments, the hair designate will end up opposite to the queen, not with the queen, in half the experiment by chance alone. Now, if this happens, there is no difficulty because she is the hair designate, there is no queen here. So, immediately she should become the potential queen she should become hyper aggressive. She uh, then what we do, then is the critical part. Then we take this potential queen, we move her to the left and we move the queen to the right. If this is the true hair designate for the whole colony, known and acceptable to everybody, she should have no difficulty on this side. Move her back, she should have no difficulty, she should be acceptable on both sides. However, this happy set of circumstances can happen only about half the times. In the remaining half of the experiments, the unfortunate hair designate ends up along with the queen and she cannot do anything anymore. What will happen then is the best individual amongst these will become a potential queen. And now the real drama is what happens if I move this potential queen here and the queen here and bring the potential queen face to face with the hair designate. This is when there should be a problem because this is the true hair designate for the whole colony and this is not. This is only temporary. Now, there should be a problem and this individual should give up or be made to give up and this individual should become a potential queen. 
that is not the end of the story because the acid test for this individual is that we should move her to the other side and she should be successful there. Okay. So, we have predictions the potential queen 1 the first one to become aggressive should be unacceptable to the opposite side in about half the experiments and a second aggressive individual should emerge. But the second individual should be acceptable to both sides and there should never be a third contender to the throne as it were. If you cut the nest in half there should be maximum of 2 contenders not 3. And so, with these predictions the student did as you can imagine these are very tedious experiments to do, but she managed to do 8 experiments and she found that in 3 out of 8 experiments no p q 2 emerged that is the first one was successful on both sides. In 5 experiments the first one was not successful she had to go back to work a second one came up and she was successful on both sides. So, that both predictions were upheld p q 2 emerged in about 50 percent of the experiments no p q 3 emerged both predictions were upheld suggesting that there is indeed a hair designate known to all the wasps. People all the time used to ask us do you know who the successor is and we used to say no we do not. Now, we got great we got a great kick in publishing a paper saying we know that the wasps know we do not know, but we know that the wasps know and that indeed is the title of our paper we know that the wasps know there are cryptic successors to the to the to the queenship in this species. But the most important informative part of this experiment is not revealed in the numbers it is there in the qualitative impression. What we found to our great surprise is under this situation under this situation we expected a great conflict between these two individuals. In fact, as you can imagine all the things I have been telling you are stories of peace we were actually itching to see some fights we wanted to see some fight. In fact, one of the reasons why we did this experiment is we were hoping that there will be a fight we were all waiting to see a fight and we thought there will be a huge fight between these two, but there was absolutely no fight this individual quietly went back to work as if she knew oh you are back I am off to work and this individual immediately became hyper aggressive there was not even a interaction between there was not a single interaction between these two individuals. It is remarkable that the potential queen number 2 was never challenged she did not receive a single act of aggression by the potential queen 1 or by any of the workers either when she emerged in the presence of the p q 1 or when she was moved to the opposite side. And that is why we claim that the hair designate was obviously known and acceptable to all the wasps including the p q 1 otherwise you would not expect such a result. And yet the fact remains we cannot identify it still we cannot identify it. that still is an unsolved problem. So, the answer to question 5 is there is a hair designate even though we cannot identify her presence of the queen the wasps seem to know who she is. Now, you might be wondering if there is so much peace where is the war where is the conflict and we wondered too for some time and then we realized the way to see conflict the way to see war is to bring another wasp from another colony anywhere near a colony then the whole behavior of the wasp changes and in fact if a wrong wasp tries to land on the nest she is actively repelled and they seem to know even before the wasp lands whether it is one of their own or a foreign one and the reaction to a foreign wasp is totally different. So, we actually decided to study the way in which they recognize self from non self here self is not one's body, but one's colony we developed a series of techniques to study this we asked can the wasp discriminate nest mates from non nest mates. I will go through this rather briefly we developed a what we call a triplet assay where you have two individuals are nest mates of each other there is a third foreign individual and we measured all the six possible directions of interactions we quantified these interactions and we looked at tolerance we measured what we call a tolerance index we were able to show that the tolerance this is how we developed the tolerance index we were able to show that the tolerance index was such that the wasps were able to distinguish nest mates from non nest mates if they were present on the nest if they eclosed in the laboratory even if they were isolated from the nest on the day of eclosion. In order to deprive them of this ability you had to get them out of their nest 24 hours before their actual birth. So, we actually learned to do a caesarean for these wasps we took we watched these pupae carefully and we found that the pupae slowly become brown in color and we predict we learned how to predict that this one will be born tomorrow. 
if we make we learn to predict this one day in advance, then we slowly cut open the cap with the forceps, took out this inactive unfinished individual, wrapped her in a tissue paper, quickly ran to the laboratory, put her in a petri dish in an incubator at uh, 37 degrees. Next morning she was up and ready. And when these wasps had no clue who, where they belonged, they could not discriminate. That is what we were able to show. Which means that the cues that you use to recognize foreigners, you acquire after your birth. And therefore, you are very peaceful to your nest mates. Because you, you are born, you wake up and say, okay, these are all my friends. Anybody whom I have not seen is my enemy. So, you can see that within a colony, there is very little scope for aggression, but with foreigners, there is a great scope for aggression because I have never seen this individual again. So, we did these kinds of experiments to show that nestmate discrimination is well developed and war with outsiders therefore, is possible. Then we asked, how do the wasps treat intruders from other colonies? So, in one experiment, we took all the members of one colony and introduced them into a cage containing another colony. So, this colony was in home territory, they had their nest, they were living there and the wasps which came were intruders, they did not have a nest, we just caught hold of them and introduced them in this case. And the response of the residents to the intruders was very sophisticated and very nuanced, it was not a simple reaction. What we found was that when the members were introduced, young alien workers were admitted freely into the colony. Just come and join my colony, no problem. Old alien workers were allowed to live, but only away from the nest. You want to live in that corner, I have no problem, do not come anywhere near me. The alien queen was attacked and dismembered wherever she was. They went and located her, found her and tore her to pieces. So, their recognition abilities are so nuanced. It is not just that you are a foreigner. What kind of a foreigner are you? Are you the kind that is going to cause damage to me, great deal of damage, little bit of damage, no damage. Now, we have been able to do a number of experiments by actually introducing young wasps and creating composite colonies and studying them. I would not uh, have time to go into the details, but that is a new experimental paradigm that was possible. Can the wasp keep track of intruders who sneak into their nest? And as I already said, and there is more data to show that. No, because they need the method by which they discriminate nestmates and non nestmates, the cues and the templates in their brain with which they match their cues. See, we think it happens like this. I have some template in my brain which, which I match. I smell you and match and say, yes, you are ours. Yes, no, you are not. We need a template in the brain and we need this cue on the body of the wasps. Both of these are acquired after birth from the nest and therefore, there is no discrimination within the nest possible. So, intra colony discrimination is undeveloped, war with insiders is virtually not possible. There is no evidence of intra colony kin discrimination. Young alien workers who are accepted into foreign colonies become completely integrated into their foster colonies and may even go on to become the next PQ. We have now done experiments where we can show that if you remove a queen, the one which becomes hyper aggressive may actually be a young alien who was introduced some, some uh, one month ago. So, the complete identity is lost once they are inside the colony, but as long as they are outside the colony, there is great. So, you have war and peace, the wasps have a great propensity to make war outsiders and an equally great propensity to maintain peace with insiders. You can see this is built in to their mechanism of functioning. The way they function, the way they have evolved allows war with outsiders and prevents war from insiders, it is a built in mechanism. From an evolutionary point of view, war with outsiders is easier to explain than peace with insiders. Why is there peace with insiders? However, war with outsiders is not of much use unless one can combine it with peace from insiders. If you are going to make war with everybody, you go back and become a mosquito, you become a solitary insect. If you have to maintain social life for millions of years, you must have this combination not just peace with insiders, you must also have the ability to make war with outsiders, because otherwise outsiders will constantly come and steal your stuff and then you are lost. So, you can see this fine balance between conflict and cooperation is essential for the stability of social life. If you do not have both of these, you cannot have social life. You cannot have social life just with peace, you cannot have social life just with war, you need to see need both of these, that is what these experiments tell us. It is this dual strategy 
this ability to tread a fine balance between conflict and cooperation that we I believe accounts for the success of insect societies making them what we call super organisms. These insects are sometimes called super organisms a whole colony functions like an organism. Now, if you come back and reflect I said we study this in order to reflect on ourselves if you reflect on ourselves we are not that different we seem to be the same and here I have my favorite philosopher's quotation Voltaire said it is lamentable that to be a good patriot one must become the enemy of the rest of mankind that is what the French philosopher said and you can see that that is echoed in the experiments that are actually found. I come back now very explicitly why do we study these wasps for same reason answer boys however I certainly do not think that we should blindly imitate insects or any aspect of nature is is not equal to ought. So, then what is the use of studying I believe I think that the was these was can hold a mirror to us and offer us a means to reflect on our own society and learn more about ourselves. We often need to see someone else to see how we behave. It is not obvious to us sometimes. We take a very trivial example. You go to your neighbor's house and you see how they have organized the furniture in their drawing room, and then you say, Ah, I could do the same, I could use the space as well as they have done. Until you see someone else do it, you do not realize. Or worse still, you go to somebody's house and then come back and say, Thank God we do not treat our children like that. But you only realize that you treat your children differently when you see someone else do that. You go to another culture and you realize that we are Indians are different, we do not do the same, it say the same way as the Japanese do. So, you need someone to hold a mirror to understand ourselves. So, I think we should study animals, insects, nature not to copy, but to understand ourselves better in reflection that I think is the goal of this. I want to thank a large number of students, we have had received money from various organizations. Uh, but the actual money we need for this kind of work as you can see is rather limited. What we need is a large number of bright young students and this is only a small sample of the students I have had the pleasure to work with. Sometimes people come and ask me where are the sophisticated instruments in your laboratory and I say they are all here. Large number of heads we often sit together 3, 4, 5, 10 people we brainstorm and we try to uh, see how a problem can be solved and I have great pleasure in working in that mode. Thank you very much.